Yes. Great. Uh, you guys let me know and we should start. Uh, I figure some of y'all will trickle in eventually, but I don't want to keep you too long. I think it should be okay to start, Dr. Margos. All right. Um, so this talk actually is for both you and our colleagues in radiation oncology. So you'll notice that I will skip past some of those unnecessary slides that I put in for them. Um, but it's going to focus on the use of MRI um, for uh, planning surgery and radiation therapy, as well as for biopsy planning, which is sort of the mainstay. But that's, uh, you'll see that's kind of obvious. Um, okay. Uh, I have a, uh, a couple disclosures. So we're gonna talk about why we would consider using prostate MRI, um, what are the current techniques, um, how we use uh, PIRADS for assessment and reporting, the comparison of how we think about prostate MRI based on the indication, and then I'll talk a little bit about comparing MRI versus PET. Um, so these are the uh, 2015 recommendations for uh, uh, the use of prostate MRI. As you know, as of last year, they've been updated. And uh, MRI is now recommended uh, in the uh, face of a negative biopsy and uh, persistent suspicion. Um, and this is a CT of the prostate. So you can see that Whereas you can kind of figure out where the prostate is. It doesn't really tell you anything about the anatomy of the prostate. Um, ultrasound uh, actually gives you a lot of features in the prostate, but it's not useful for delineating suspicious versus likely benign findings. And prostate MRI has the advantage of both anatomic detail as well as functional characterization. And that's why it's become the mainstay for uh, uh, the detection of in-situ prostate cancer. Um, and as you probably know, there was uh, a uh, level one uh, multi-center clinical trial comparing standard uh, systematic biopsies versus MR targeted biopsy only, um, with most centers using either cognitive fusion or uh, software fusion. And um, when you look at the overall results, um, this is the flow chart uh, or the, the pie chart. And what we find is that um, we find more significant cancer and less insignificant cancer and defer biopsies in about a third of patients in the MRI uh, target only arm. Um, the interesting thing about this uh, is that the total amount of cancer in the two arms is nearly identical. And our colleagues across the street have raised the question, are we finding the same cancers but simply different parts of them? And we don't have outcome data to know for certain. Um, and while you can conjecture that we are in fact finding the same cancers and that this may not uh, influence outcome, the fact that we could defer biopsies in almost a third of patients and that patients receiving biopsies uh, received only about a third as many biopsy cores as those in the systematic group um, raised the consideration for targeted biopsy only. Uh, but obviously, it's not that simple. And so using these data and other data, uh, the Pirates Committee has a, a flow chart for the consideration of uh, MRI-targeted biopsy. And you'll notice that in the uh, components of the, uh, the MR uh, negative and MR positive uh, aspects that we will miss some significant cancers if we do not uh, perform systematic biopsy. Um, but this number is relatively small. And there is a feeling that uh, these cancers may be small enough that with continued surveillance, we would capture them before there is any biologically significant uh, change in outcome. Uh, but obviously, we don't have those data yet. There is no uh, long-term uh, trial to evaluate that. So what are the techniques that we use for uh, prostate MRI? Uh, 
MPMRI means multi-parametric MRI. Uh, and this includes T2-weighted imaging for anatomy, as well as diffusion-weighted imaging and dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging, um, with spectroscopic imaging now considered uh, optional. I'm not going to go into whether we should consider biparametric, which is T2-weighted imaging and diffusion only. Um, that is becoming a popular option for biopsy planning only. However, there are cases where diffusion fails. And in those cases, the DCE is uh, paramount for uh, evaluating the prostate. Similarly, for evaluating response to treatment, either, either radiation or focal therapy, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging is still crucial. And so we do not recommend getting rid of it, except in very select cases. Um, so as I mentioned, T2-weighted imaging is used for characterization of the transition zone as well as for staging. Diffusion-weighted imaging and the apparent diffusion coefficient map, which is a way of quantifying uh, the degree of diffusion restriction, is the most specific component. It tends to be abnormal uh, and highly abnormal only in clinically significant cancer with overlap of mild diffusion uh, restriction in inflammation, uh, low-grade disease, and some sparse high-grade disease. However, dynamic contrast-enhanced perfusion imaging is the most sensitive, so it doesn't discriminate well between in, uh, insignificant and clinically significant cancer, but it's also the best predictor of total tumor volume. Um, and it's important to consider uh, technical aspects when pr uh, protocoling prostate MRI. So you may notice that in some uh, outside reports, we may criticize the diffusion-weighted uh, acquisition. And this can be because a high B-value image was not included. You can see here um, that uh, you can barely see on these uh, B1400 or very high B-value images that this area in the transition zone is slightly brighter um, than the rest of the prostate, whereas you do not see this at an intermediate B value. Uh, and that's crucial if you want to discriminate between category three and category four, which for transition zone lesions can make the difference between uh, a negative and positive scan. And this is why a diffusion weighted imaging is so important. As you know, a Gleason pattern three disease is largely disordered glands with a lot of uh, glandular uh, uh, stroma and luminal space, whereas higher grade disease is generally small round blue cell tumors where we see restriction of free water motion. And so here's an example of how this works with MRI. So these are two different cells, one a small round blue cell like you would see in cancer and the other a large glandular cell. Um, and so when we uh, start the MRI pulse, if we wait a short amount of time, the water molecule hasn't moved outside of the, uh, the area where we would be sensitive for signal. So the water molecule that we've excited is still inside its, its uh, domain, and you would get signal on both the low and the high, uh, sorry, in both the restricted and unrestricted uh, uh, cases. But if we wait a little longer, we have enough time for the water molecule to move out of its uh, initial uh, area on uh, in the luminal cell, and it would no longer contribute signal, whereas it stays inside that same constricted region in the small round blue cell, uh, and therefore uh, preserves signal. And that's why you get that bright image, uh, that bright portion of the image on the high B value uh, DWI. Uh, the time resolution in dynamic contrast enhanced imaging is also crucial. So here you see a pre-contrast image where the prostate is uniformly dark on T1 weighted imaging. And here is the first image where we begin to see enhancement, in this case in the transition zone. But only eight seconds later, um, you can see that the rest of the transition zone because of BPH is now enhancing to a similar degree. Um, and even with subtraction, it's uh, only slightly conspicuous uh, 
against the background of the transition zone. We can use the enhancement profile to generate pharmacokinetic maps, which are quantitative. Uh, and these are useful primarily because they always identify areas of early enhancement. The actual quantitative values may be useful for evaluation in follow-up, um, but have not been shown to be useful for uh, the uh, characterization of significant versus insignificant cancer. Um, and then we can consider some changes to the way we acquire t uh, T2-aided imaging. Some sites will acquire a 3D T2-aided image, which means that the resolution is the same in all three planes. The problem is that these images are more susceptible to artifact, uh, and you can lose fine detail. Um, and so we generally avoid them at Cornell because they don't seem to provide uh, added value, except possibly for contouring the prostate, but at the expense of very frequent artifacts. Uh, and then spectroscopic imaging is probably useful, but it is very time consuming. And because the combination of dynamic contrast and diffusion weighted imaging is very accurate for the discrimination of clinically significant disease from indolent disease and um, uh, benign change, um, the slight added specificity of spectroscopic imaging, considering its low spatial resolution and the long time it takes to acquire it, has made it largely a research tool again. And this brings us to how do we assess and report prostate MRI? We use a system uh, designated as Prostate Imaging Reporter and Data System, or PIRAD. Um, and this was reported initially in 2015. Um, there was an update in uh, 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 last year um, where we refined some of the components. Um, it's also available on the American College of Radiology website, um, and it describes the technique that we should use to acquire prostate MRI, the expected normal appearance on each of the components, assessment and reporting of abnormal areas, and staging of prostate cancer. Um, and I'm going to focus mainly on how we evaluate the assessment and reporting. Um, it also defines quality standards. Um, and this is important because depending on where you practice, you may not have a late model three Tesla scanner, but you can still acquire adequate quality on a low field or, or normal field MRI, 1.5 Tesla. Um, however, you may require an indirect recoil. It also describes uh, some uh, artifacts that we want to make certain to report and describe how they make uh, compromised diagnostic competence, uh, such as hemorrhage uh, and motion artifacts. Prostate imaging reported data systems version 2 and version 2.1 is designed for assessing primary significant cancer. This means in situ uh, prostate cancer that has not been treated and is grade group two or worse. It doesn't address a number of issues. It doesn't address a PET imaging or ultrasound. It does not address treatment planning, and it does not address the post-therapy appearance. Um, and since we were mentioning ultrasound, um, I wanted to uh, uh, describe that we can actually uh, evaluate the uh, prostate in terms of size fairly well with a standard transabdominal ultrasound. So if you look at um, this, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, this image here, um, this is acquired transabdominally. The pubic symphysis is here, this is the urinary bladder, and the prostate is here. And although we don't really get a lot of sense of the features, we can at least see where the urethra is and we can measure the prostate. Um, we get a little better sense on this transabdominal uh, transverse image. Um, where you can see the urethra coming in, the peripheral zone, and the transition zone. So if you just need to evaluate the size of the prostate, uh, at a transabdominal ultrasound is an efficient way to do that. Uh, and this brings us to interpretation and reporting. So this is described in the PIRADS document, which is available on the American College of Radiology website. There's also a, a report template 
um, that your referrers uh, may uh, use. And uh, it may be conspicuously similar to uh, what you've been seeing at Cornell for some reason. Um, the location is based on a diagram. Um, and so you can see here that this is a sagittal cartoon of the prostate. Um, and here at the base, mid gland, and apex, we can identify the peripheral zone, um, the central zone, which is really only at the base, um, the transition zone, anterior fibromusculostroma, uh, and the urethra. Uh, and this is the cartoon that we use to describe the location of abnormalities in the prostate. And that's why you may hear us describe things as posterolateral mid gland. That would just uh, identify uh, this particular uh, region in the peripheral zone. Um, and you can see that um, when you look at the various locations, um, now that I've outlined them, you can see that the internal signal characteristics are uh, generally distinct. Um, the only difference being that the central zone is very similar to the transition zone other than its location. So it's uh, generally posterior to the urethra, investing the uh, ejaculatory duct. Um, and then we divide the prostate anterior and posterior basically at the level of the urethra, although practically it's usually at the midway point. Um, and then we uh, divide it up sort of midway from the midline in terms of posterolateral and posteromedial. And the reason this is important is the posterolateral peripheral gland is the part that abuts the neurovascular bundle. Um, and uh, uh, we added uh, the uh, peripheral zone posteromedial base in version 2.1. Um, and so uh, going into a little more detail, uh, here's the apex. You can see there's really no transition zone here. Um, and that the uh, peripheral zone is generally high signal on tetoided imaging. Uh, and the anterior fibromuscular stroma is dark, and you can see the uh, muscular urethra uh, here, and there's no transition zone this low in the, in the prostate. Um, at the level of the mid gland, um, you can see the ejaculatory ducts about to enter the vero montanum. Um, the peripheral zone remains high signal. The transition zone is generally heterogeneous intermediate signal. Uh, anterior fibromuscular stroma remains low signal, and again, the urethra is identified centrally. Uh, and then at the base, uh, again, the, uh, we see the ejaculatory ducts. Um, we see the peripheral zone uh, as the high signal tetoated image, the transition zone anteriorly. The central zone is this sort of posterior aspect that uh, investigates the uh, ejaculatory ducts, low signal anterior fibromuscular stroma. Uh, and again, the urethra centrally. And then above the level of the prostate, we have high signal in the seminal vesicles and in the uh, bladder lumen. Um, and the other thing that can be useful to consider is that both the surgical capsule and the central zone tend to be low signal. Um, the difference being um, that the, um, the uh, central zone has no early enhancement, whereas you can see early enhancement adjacent to the surgical capsule. Um, and while the um, central zone may have be, be mildly hyperintense on high B value DWI, it's not dark on uh, the ADC. It has mild hypointensity, whereas you can see this sort of black line uh, at the level of the surgical capsule uh, because it's uh, more fibrous. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is Denavellier's fascia. This is the fascia separating the periprostatic from the uh, perirectal fascia. It's generally not this conspicuous on MRI, um, but our colleagues in radiation oncology are very preoccupied about it. And how we score the suspicion depends on the zone uh, and then the primary pulse sequence and a secondary pulse sequence. So you can see for the peripheral zone, we first consider the diffusion weighted image in category, and then only uh, if, the D, if it's category three, would we consider whether or not there's uh, uh, associated abnormal DCE. For the peripheral zone, it's a little more complex. Um, for T2 categories one, four, and five, 
this is also the overall category. For categories two and three, we have to consider the uh, diffusion weighted imaging. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. So um, now what are these categories? Um, for T2 weighted imaging, uh, category one or, or very low suspicion is when there's a homogeneous uh, intermediate signal uh, in the uh, transition zone or when a nodule of BPH is completely encapsulated, when it has a, a distinct black line outlining it. Uh, category two in the transition zone means something which is either circumscribed or only partially encapsulated, so it's not completely encapsulated. Category three is a lesion in the transition zone where you can't really tell what the borders are like because of either artifact or it's obscured by adjacent prostatic hyperplasia. Category four are things that uh, do not have a sharp margin where their margin is either irregular or blurred. And the difference between category four and category five is category five is either large, meaning more than 1.5 centimeters, or has invasive characteristics. Um, and there are a number of descriptors that we use. I've color-coded them where uh, green is uh, generally low suspicion and red is generally high suspicion. Obscured is this intermediate category three descriptor. Invasive is very high uh, suspicion. Now circumscribed and smooth uh, is tricky because it means different things in the transition zone versus in the peripheral zone. Although we generally do not use the T2 descriptor uh, for uh, ascribing a suspicion score in the peripheral zone. And here's some examples. Um, you can see here there's a fair amount of BPH in this prostate, and this nodule is right up against the surgical capsule. So it's hard to know exactly um, how to describe uh, the margin. Whereas here, the transition zone is um, much more uniform. And you can see that um, the border here is a little bit blurry. Also, the shape is lenticular. And those are both high suspicion or category four and five descriptors. Similarly, uh, this lesion here has this irregular border, which is also high suspicion. Um, and then this lesion here um, has this sort of blurred margin. It doesn't look like the BPH is causing it to be blurred. This lesion here, on the other hand, has this nice black line around it. And so that's encapsulated. Uh, and then this is obviously uh, grossly invasive outside of the prostate. And here we see that the capsule is a little irregular, and that also confers uh, invasive characteristics. Um, and then we also want to stage a lesion, which is to evaluate extraprostatic extension. So you can see the normal side of the prostate here has this nice black line around it. Um, obviously, there's not a true capsule, but the membrane, uh, along with the distinction between the signal in the prostate glandular tissue and the signal in the periprostatic fat um, results in this thin black line around the outside of the prostate. And here you can see that um, there's irregularity with some portions that are extending into the periprostatic fat. On this image, you can see where the normal uh, part of the prostate is on the contralateral side. And on the involved side, you can see that this lesion is extending outside of where we'd expect the capsule to be. Um, and additionally, we see that it corresponds with abnormal signal on the ADC map. Um, and so the neurovascular bundle would be these little dots over here. And we can see that this is approaching the little dots on the other side. So this makes us worried about neurovascular bundle extension. Now here's a, an image where there's some motion blurring and so we don't get as good detail but you can see that there's a lot of abnormal signal and obliteration of the normal rectoprostatic angle. Uh, and then this lesion appears to be confined to the prostate, um, but it has this broad base of contact, and that's intermediate suspicion for capsular involvement. And uh, the reason why it's important to assess both the T2 category and the diffusion category is something which has this black line all the way around, that's always very low suspicion. Um, and so that's 
always category one. Something where you can't tell if there's a black line or whether there's a black line, but it doesn't encapsulate the whole thing. Then we want to look at the degree of diffusion restriction. And if the DWI is kind of bright, but it's not the brightest thing, and the ADC is kind of dark, but it's not the darkest thing, um, then it's still category two, load suspicion. But if it corresponds to the brightest thing on the DWI and the darkest thing on the ADC, um, which is a DWI category four or five, then the overall category is three, intermediate or equivocal suspicion. Most of these will still be BPH nodules, but a significant number, more than you'd expect by systematic biopsy, will turn out to have cancer. Um, and here's a, a way of thinking about this as a flow chart. So you start here, is it peripheral or transition zone? And then depending on the zone, you look at the dominant pulse sequence, um, and that will tell you if you need to look at another pulse sequence to come up with the overall category. Um, and here are some examples of these encapsulated nodules. So you can see here on the sagittal T2 and the coronal T2, you can see the capsule all the way around. There's a little motion here, and it's hard to see the capsule on the axial T2, but the other two pulse sequences confirm that this is a very low suspicion lesion. And so even though it has restricted diffusion, we don't care. Um, and so this is overall category one. It also has abnormal diffusion, or sorry, uh, perfusion, but again, we don't care about that for uh, transition zone lesions because um, BPH so commonly has abnormal perfusion. On the other hand, this has some encapsulation, but most of this is just circumscribed. It has you know, some capsule here, but you can see that there's just this uh, distinct border to it. And it's the darkest thing on the ADC and the brightest thing on the DWI. It also has focal enhancement, but again, we don't care about that. What this means is it's T2 category two, but overall category three. Um, again, because we, we care about the DWI and not the DCE. Um, and then uh, we use DWI primarily for the peripheral zone. And um, so what we want to look at is um, the ADC uh, and the DWI and the shape. And the shape is important because if you see something that is linear, um, that is low suspicion, category two. Uh, if you see something which is uh, the darkest thing on the ADC and the brightest thing on the DWI, uh, or, sorry, uh, brightest thing on the, the DWI, um, or which is invasive. So this is large, and this is, uh, looks a little invasive, it's going outside of the prostate. Um, then this is, would be category five. This would be category five only if it measures more than 1.5 centimeters. And then this is dark and bright, but it's not the brightest thing on the DWI or the darkest thing on the ADC, so it's category three. Um, and then again, uh, the shape now plays a role. So things that are wedge-shaped or linear are now category two on DWI and overall. Um, there's also the idea of the hemorrhage exclusion sign. And what this means is on the pre-contrast T1, you see bright signal. And that suggests the presence of citrate, which is an anticoagulant, and therefore, uh, absence of cancer because cancer is uh, catabolic and would catabolize all of the citrate. Unfortunately, it doesn't work because you can see here, it's dark on the ADC, bright on the DWI, it's got a lesion on T2. Could this all be from inflammation? It could, um, and we don't see focal enhancement, although sometimes um, it can be hard to appreciate that even on the subtraction map. Uh, but this turned out to be a cancer. So we, um, the, the hemorrhage exclusion sign can be somewhat reassuring, but you shouldn't rely on it. Um, and then the last idea is the overall gestalt of the prostate. Is it a pristine prostate where the peripheral gland is uniformly high signal and there's no focal abnormality in the transition zone? Is it just a little heterogeneous, but you don't really feel like you'd miss something real? Or is it very heterogeneous, and who knows uh, what is actually abnormal? We wanted to come up with a way to categorize this, but there's not 
a reliable way for us to describe this to give you a sense of the level of confidence that a quote unquote negative MRI is truly negative. Um, and so we're hoping to come up with a quantitative way of assessing this for Pyrex version three. But right now we don't really have a way of communicating this. Um, we know that Pyrex predicts upgrading on uh, surgery. So um, higher Pyrex categories tend to correlate with um, either upgrading on active surveillance or at prostatectomy. Um, and that um, Pyrex also predicts outcome uh, when looking at um, uh, prostatectomy, uh, but probably because it's predicting grade. Um, and uh, we also know that uh, it predicts outcome um, in, uh, other, uh, uh, in other sites as well. So, so the UCLA data as well as the Korean data all show that uh, Pyreds is a predictor um, of uh, both the findings at surgery and um, the risk of biochemical failure. Um, and we're looking for new biomarkers for Pyreds version three. I'm actually on a committee that's supposed to figure that out for you. We're not there yet, um, but we're, we're not gonna rush this. So very soon, maybe, maybe not soon. So now let's think about how do we use prostate imaging depending on why we're doing prostate MRI. MRI is now primarily used for biopsy planning. It's also used for um, staging, for radiation therapy and surgery, uh, and for active surveillance and focal therapy that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and when you think about um, the indication, that also gives you a sense of what's the most important thing. So if it's biopsy planning, you want to know where's the center of the abnormality because that's what you want to hit. And to a lesser extent, the size because you want to make certain that you sample it. Um, most of these, if not all of these, will be stage T2. And you need to use all pulse sequences to figure out what the overall suspicion is. And you really only need an indirectal coil um, if you think that there is some limitation to your MRI scanner. For surgery, the most important thing is staging. Most of these, but not all, will be stage T2. And so the most important thing for surgical planning is evaluation of the borders of the prostate. And therefore the T2-weighted image or the anatomic image is most important. And this is where you may want to consider an indirect coil because you want the highest spatial resolution possible. For radiation therapy planning, um, still a lot of the patients will be T2, but to a lesser degree than with surgery. And probably the most important thing is to evaluate for metastatic disease, uh, deter determine whether they're appropriate for uh, HDR brachytherapy versus external beam, and whether they need to extend the field uh, to get metastatic disease. Uh, and so diffusion is actually the most useful to look for abnormal lymph nodes and bone lesions. Um, and we want to avoid using an endorectal coil because it can distort the, the prostate anatomy if they're gonna give a focal boost. And for focal therapy, Again, these lesions, uh, these patients should, should be stage T2. Um, and the size is the most important thing. And DCE is the best estimator of size. And so again, you probably don't need an indirect coil, but you do want to get the best quality you can. Uh, and so this brings us to thinking about what are the differences in thinking between surgery and biopsy planning. So again, for surgical planning, you want to evaluate the capsule. Uh, and that's why you may want to use an indirect coil. For biopsy planning, you only really need to figure out, is it suspicious enough for a biopsy and where is it? Uh, and generally, you don't need the indirect coil. And in fact, you may want to consider avoiding full pelvis imaging because that takes extra time um, and your patients are likely low grade to begin with. Um, and so these are some of the very first images um, for image fusion targeted biopsy. Um, I got these from the NIH because I didn't want to be too nepotistic and get them from Lenny Marks at UCLA. And this is what uh, your uh, colleague there, Tim McClure, is doing now. And I chose this because it's the same system. It's still the Philips Uranab system. Um, but you can see we've now switched to transperineal. The ability to show a 3D image is markedly improved. Um, and so we've changed some of the technology, but largely the approach. Um, and there are a number of different methods for uh, image fusion targeted biopsy. 
Um, there's the articulated arm method, electromagnetic tracking like Euronav, and image registration, which um, is most popular uh, with the uh, Coelis system that we don't have at Cornell. Um, and there are different advantages and disadvantages to each. The articulated arm is a little cumbersome, but it can stabilize the prostate. The electromagnetic arm is susceptible to interference. And the image registration has the advantage that you can't really have motion misregistration because you re-register every time you move the, um, the biopsy guide. However, it means that you need to re-register whenever you move it. And so it's not a real-time system, but rather a kind of um, step and shoot. Um, and so here's just a list of a number of different manufacturers and when they were approved. And uh, more of these are coming on the market uh, even now. So um, when you wind up uh, in your practice, it's important to consider um, what's important to you and also what you already have, uh, because that may determine what you get to work with. Um, and there are technical advances such as um, co-registration. So you want to be able to use a deformable co-registration in case the shape of the prostate and MRI and ultrasound is not the same. And we now have software that can force the MR to conform to the shape of the prostate uh, at ultrasound targeted biopsy. Um, there's also in-bore biopsy. Um, it has the advantage that you get real-time MRI confirmation of the needle inside the, inside the target, um, but it's much more time-consuming it's more expensive because you're using up magnet time, which is very expensive. You may need to use local anesthesia. Um, and generally, you only get the targeted biopsy. Um, and so generally, this is reserved for small, high suspicion targets in the anterior prostate or the apex, where um, you've tried to do a biopsy and it's failed with standard image fusion targeted biopsy, or you just worry that it's going to be iffy to try to get it with image fusion targeted biopsy in the first place. Um, and we haven't actually done it, any of these at Cornell, even though we have the setup, just because we've gotten so good at image fusion targeted biopsy. Uh, credit to uh, your professor. Um, so when you look at the performance, there is some suggestion that the performance of in-board uh, in is significantly better than uh, image fusion. Um, but this advantage is small, uh, and probably you can predict for whom it would uh, be a real advantage. Um, and there, was, uh, th there have been a number of head-to-head -head studies, and in fact, the data are a little mixed. So um, the first study, which was randomized in 2015, did find an advantage to INBOR, but a larger study in 2017 did not find a significant difference. A retrospective non-randomized study in 2019 did find an advantage, but there's uh, potential bias issues in that study. Um, and so uh, here's a, a very brief overview of how it works. Um, you will get a 3D presentation in two planes um, during your biopsy session. You can see that this image on our left is after biopsy needles have been deployed, and the image on the right is before. And, and so it gives it in two different orientations. Um, you can also overlay the uh, systematic map. And you can see that this map is geometrically optimized. And if you look at the data that came out of UCLA, you don't see as big an advantage of image fusion targeted biopsy compared with systematic biopsy versus the data coming out of NIH. And one of the big differences is that Leonard Marks had this optimized systematic template and uh, if you look at the actual data, there is higher yield of systematic biopsy um, with this optimized template. Um, and uh, if you find a positive biopsy, you can actually record that location and go back and biopsy that same location, even if it was only a systematic biopsy uh, on a repeat uh, uh, active surveillance uh, session. Um, and so what I'm going to do now um, is switch screen sharing um, to this. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear the audio, but this is actually how we process a case. 
Can you hear the audio? No. Uh, all right. So. Uh, we can't hear the audio. <laughs> Sorry. OK. So what I'm describing here is um, this is after we open the case. You can see the case in um, the, uh, the viewer that we use to both um, interpret and segment the prostate. Um, and we can optimize some of the image quality factors. Um, there's zoom and window level. Um, it has a stereotyped appearance of the T2-weighted image, uh, the dynamic contrast image, ADC map, DWI, coronal, and sagittal. The uh, first thing that we do, though, is uh, segment the prostate. Um, and uh, so we'll get to, uh, let's see. I think we... Oh, and we can also uh, change uh, the setup. If, uh, let's say, one of the series ha has an artifact, we can choose a different series. And so that's why sometimes it can take a little longer for some patients than others. Um, and you'll see what shows up in this uh, viewport after we segment the prostate. Um, okay, so segmenting the prostate um, involves finding the uh, base. So um, we, uh, it, it guides you through the segmentation uh, process. We go to the base um, and then find where you see the top of the prostate there. Um, uh, we click on that uh, and then we go to the apex. And you can see that we can click on any of the three planes find the apex, click on that, um, and then click next. And then we place these um, electronic seeds around the outside of the prostate to give the software a sense of what the overall shape of the prostate is. Um, and uh, right now, the software doesn't use any machine learning techniques to try to segment the prostate. This is actually coming uh, in another version. Um, and so what we do at this point is refine the automatic segmentation. Um, the most important thing for us is to make certain that where there is a target, uh, that the segmentation is correct there. Um, it has trouble at the apex, um, but generally uh, that doesn't uh, make uh, a huge difference. And then we can sort of uh, adjust the uh, segmentation on any of the three planes. So uh, here we're going back to uh, where we identify lesions. You can see this image there on the upper right now shows a segmentation of the prostate. And you can see that uh, there's this uh, dark area in the posterior medial left aspect of the prostate in the peripheral gland. Uh, it's low signal on the ADC uh, here. It's low signal on the T2. It's low signal on, uh, sorry, it's high signal on the DWI dynamic contrast. Um, there's this weird artifact from how it recorded the session. I don't know why it did that. Um, and what I'm showing here is that if we segment discontinuous areas, it will make them into two lesions. But if we um, segment the area in between, it's smart enough to merge them into a single lesion. Um, and so at this point, uh, we want to characterize the lesion um, using standard Pyrad's uh, descriptors. Um, and the software actually now gives us the option of uh, giving a standard uh, Pyrad's description to the lesion. So you can see, here's the overall description of the lesion that will show up in the report, but a lot of it's empty. So the first thing we do is establish the location or locations of the lesion on that same cartoon from the Pyrad's document. The next thing is we characterize the T2-weighted descriptors there's a few standardized descriptors that we can use. Um, and then if we want to modify any of the components, um, we can actually uh, change the T2 descriptors. Now, again, this is a peripheral gland lesion. And so the T2 description isn't important except in terms of defining invasiveness. Um, and so then we go to describing the uh, DWI. And basically, it uh, matters whether we say it's the brightest thing or the darkest thing. Uh, and if we do that, then it looks at the size. So here we're saying it's only moderately dark and moderately bright, and therefore that's uh, a DWI category three, but we're going to say that there's focal early enhancement. And what that means is with positive early enhancement, um, we now have overall 
higher ed's category four. Um, and then all we do is um, verify the study and it's ready for you in um, uh, Profuse. It also generates a report that gets sent to PACS. Uh, and this is important because if you need to see images of where we identified the lesion, this now uh, lies within a uh, standardized report in PACS. Uh, okay, so let's go back to um, the PowerPoint. Um, and so here's an example of how would it works with Uranav. So you see this is the modified T2 and the ultrasound. As you step through it, when you get close to the target, it shows up. And when you're actually in plane, it shows up as a target. And then once the biopsy guide is through the target, you deploy. Um, and we know that image fusion targeted biopsy improves yield. So you can see that um, this is some of the early work where a lot of the patients harbored these hidden cancers. And so the early data made MRI look spectacular. And that's in large part because there were a lot of men that had, had systematic biopsies that were negative um, or were low grade and they were on active surveillance with these hidden significant cancers in the anterior prostate or at the apex um, where we could easily identify them with MRI. So that's why the yield now looks different than it did um, early on in uh, the first publications of image fusion targeted biopsy. Um, and it predicts grade um, and uh, the uh, overall uh, outcome, as we mentioned. Um, there are some limitations. As I mentioned, the image fusion um, has a risk of misregistration. Um, and so there are uh, innovations being put into place to try to automatically compensate for that. Uh, so those are coming down the pipeline. Uh, here's an example of a case where uh, this is this uh, anterior lesion, uh, where it looks very similar to anterior fibromuscular stroma, except it's dark on the ADC and bright on the DWI and DCE. So AFS is dark on T2, and it can be dark on ADC, but it should not be bright on DWI and DCE. Um, and um, so, uh, the shape is lenticular, it's got irregular borders, um, the diffusion is markedly abnormal, but because it's invasive, it invades into the AFS, this upgrades the category to category five. Uh, and so this is uh, how the report would look if you use a standardized report. Uh, and uh, so this brings us to surgical planning uh, as opposed to biopsy planning. So again, we want to stage the disease. We want to evaluate for extraprostatic extension and seminal vesicle invasion. We also want to look at lymph nodes and bones to see if there's N1 or M1 disease. Um, the endorectal coil, again, can be useful depending on the power of your MRI scanner. Most modern 3T scanners do not need an endorectal coil, although early on, um, this was a prerequisite. And there have been a number of studies that show that um, our prediction of uh, outcomes and EPE markedly improves using uh, uh, MRI. Um, and uh, this is a study that uh, Professor McClure did very early in his training. Um, and uh, this is, uh, at this point, almost a decade ago, we looked at um, about 100 cases um, and we looked at the plan before and after they had an MRI. So the plan based on biopsy alone. And what we found is we've changed the plan in almost a third of patients, most of those from non-nerve sparing to nerve sparing. And although there were seven positive margins, this never occurred where the plan was changed to nerve sparing surgery. So it appears safe to use MRI to uh, plan nerve sparing surgery. Uh, and here's an example of a case where we did change the plan to nerve sparing surgery. So there's a, a fairly large um, uh, low-grade cancer, um, and the initial plan was non-nerve sparing on the left, but what we can see is that it's an anterior lesion. The neurovascular bundle is spared. You can see how long ago this was because we have spectroscopy. Um, and so, in fact, we did upgrade the cancer uh, at uh, surgery, uh, but it was organ-confined. On the other hand, 
Uh, here's a case where we can see this abnormal low signal in the seminal vesicles, uh, both on the coronal T2 and on diffusion-weighted imaging and dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging. Um, and so this man, this, this foreign uh, uh, young man, uh, had a relatively high PSA, but was thought to be low grade on biopsy, um, and uh, decided to pursue surgery, and was in fact T3B. Um, and not uh, surprisingly, we did upgrade uh, the final pathology. Um, and here's an example of how does this look after surgery. So um, you see a mass that's sort of this intermediate low signal with a restricted diffusion on ADC and DWI and focal enhancement. So just like a suspicious cancer um, uh, in the prostate, just there's no prostate left. Um, and this brings us to MRI for radiation planning. It can be useful to help guide a boost. The most important thing that MRI does is help delineate the adjacent structures because the big problem with radiation is all the complications from uh, radiation to the bladder and the rectum and the urethra. Um, and so that, that's one of the main things that it does. It helps with um, their targeting and the volume that they uh, deliver. Uh, and it may predict response. So there are a number of things that, predict, that show MRI can predict response. Post-treatment imaging, though, uh, can be very confusing. You can see this prostate is this sort of uh, heterogeneous low signal, uh, and it becomes much harder to interpret the prostate after treatment. And so my colleagues uh, in Rome have this um, proposal. This is actually in the galleys, so I didn't give the exact proposal um, that they have uh, described because this should be published soon uh, by Valeria Panabianco. Uh, but basically, we look at T2, DWI, and DCE, primarily DWI and DCE. And we want to look for focal early enhancement, especially on the side or where we know that the cancer uh, previously was, if the prostate uh, is uh, removed or not. Um, and this brings us to, can we use MRI for therapy response? Probably DCE appears to be the best predictor. Um, this is an example of HDR brachytherapy, and the take-home is you can see that the prostate after treatment is very heterogeneous on ADC, but these focal areas of enhancement have normalized. Um, and we can also detect recurrence after radiation therapy. So you can see this prostate is very heterogeneous. There's kind of suggestion of a mass here, maybe on the ADC, but who knows you know, what to pick. But on the high D-value DWI, and especially on DCE, it's very conspicuous. So DCE becomes much more important uh, after treatment. And there are some uh, fancy uh, radiomics features that we're looking at uh, for prediction of uh, failure. Uh, we can also identify fiducial markers, uh, which are the little black uh, seeds, or, sorry, gold seeds uh, that uh, show up as black dots on MRI. Uh, and I'll uh, briefly describe focal therapy. Um, you'll probably get a talk on this from either Dr. Who or Dr. McClure, maybe both. Uh, maybe we should have a dueling uh, banjos type uh, uh, session. Um, and so there's a lot of variation of what uh, constitutes uh, image guided therapy. You could, you know, uh, dis describe IMRT, image uh, modulated radiation or intensity modulated radiation therapy. We can use HIFU and laser. You can do this with image fusion or even in bore. Um, there's no specific protocol. Um, some uh, techniques are MRI incompatible, like uh, IRE, uh, whereas some can be done uh, both uh, uh, in bore and with fusion. Uh, and the imaging appearance is a particular. So again, there's a lot of different kinds of uh, uh, focal therapy. Um, this is gaining popularity, especially now that uh, HIFU is FDA cleared. Um, and I'll show you some examples of uh, what it looks like afterwards. So again, the, the hallmark is to look for abnormal signal on DCE. Um, this is the principle. So if you've got this significant cancer and maybe some indolent cancers, can you get away with treating just the significant cancer uh, and sparing the neurovascular bundles um, and uh, prostate and uh, basically make prostate cancer treatment an outpatient clinic procedure. Um, and so it kind of depends on how accurate are we at identifying uh, the cancer. Uh, there's a number of different uh, energy types that we can use. 
Some of these are better for larger versus smaller lesions. Some like HIFU are better for posterior versus anterior lesions. Um, and so there's a lot to how we uh, choose the different kinds of energy. And here's an example of basically whole gland HIFU. So this is the prostate here. This is where the HIFU was done. So it's very dark on T-coated imaging. And it has this heterogeneous dark appearance on ADC. Uh, in the posterior right aspect of the prostate, there's maybe some dark signal here, maybe some low signal, signal on the ADC. It's not really clear. In the treatment zone, there's no abnormal perfusion on dynamic contrast. And there's no high signal on the DWI. Unfortunately, in the posterior gland, we are seeing high signal on DWI and focal enhancement. And this is biopsy proven uh, uh, recurrent disease. And then here's an example of in-bore laser therapy. Here is this very faint cancer on t imaging. So you can see how hard it is to see these. Here's an image of the laser in the lesion on MRI. So we can image the laser fiber in real time and in fact measure temperature in real time to determine the adequacy of treatment. Here's the high B-value DWI and the DCE immediately afterward. And you can see where the lesion was, there's no high signal on the high B-value DWI and this large perfusion defect. Um, here it is uh, six to 12 months later. And the treatment zone is like this little black area here with this cystic area here. Um, and then anterior to that, it doesn't look that abnormal. Um, and then on the ADC, you can see it's very bright. So normal on the ADC um, where this treatment effect is. But now there's some low signal more anteriorly with high signal on the high B-value DWI and abnormal enhancement. And this is local recurrence just peripheral to the treatment zone. Um, and so again, MRI underestimates tumor size, so you need to plan with both the MRI and with the knowledge from systematic biopsies. Um, and you need to follow with both PSA and likely imaging because your PSA will not extinguish. Um, and we don't have standards yet for um, the uh, image description for primary treatment and for follow-up. Um, so again, uh, there are no widely accepted standards. Um, and um, we need to uh, uh, follow the PSA and imaging um, and uh, use systematic biopsies for planning. Um, and, sorry, uh, it's the repeat slide. Anyway, so there's a number of literature uh, studies that support this idea, um, but again, uh, there's no one standardized uh, protocol for either treatment planning or treatment follow-up. It's also useful for benign disease. We can use it to evaluate for fertility issues. Um, you can see another Dr. McClure and uh, the chair of radiology at uh, Sloan Kettering, when they were both at uh, UCSF, um, looked at the use of MRI for male fertility. Um, we can also identify abscesses very nicely in the prostate uh, and uh, help uh, guide you to unroof them. Um, and so here's another example of abnormal seminal vesicles. So you can see there's seminal vesicles on the right. Uh, there's none on the left. But when we look at a high resolution image, these aren't really vesicles. They're just, it's sort of like this irregular cystic area. Um, and so this gentleman does not have normal seminal vesicles at all. Um, and so the uh, future of PIRADS will be more quantitative assessment. We may use some esoteric pulse sequences. And we may incorporate, incorporate more than just MRI, including uh, PET, uh, but this is years away. Um, and so uh, PIRADS version two defines the performance uh, assessment and reporting for prostate MRI. Uh, assessment is multi-parametric, qualitative, and zone-specific, and it's designed to detect primary significant cancer. Uh, and I'll just go uh, one minute on uh, PET, uh, mostly because um, we have a number of options, none of which are both good and FDA approved. So acetate and choline used to be very popular in Europe. They've basically fallen out of favor. Sodium fluoride is bone only. It's like a very accurate bone scan, but it's hard to get uh, approval. Flucyclovine is now approved and it's good, um, but uh, PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen, 
It's far and away the best test, and we're just waiting for the FDA to approve it. Uh, there are a number of studies that show that it's better than flucyclovine or uh, Acumen, um, uh, and uh, it uh, can change the management in a large number of biochemical failure cases. Um, and you can see that it's fairly sensitive, even with a PSA below 0.5. Um, and so hopefully we will see this um, reach the clinic soon, um, at least for um, post-treatment follow-up, but possibly even for um, pre-treatment planning to look for um, distant and oligometastatic disease uh, and for men who cannot undergo MRI to identify uh, targets for biopsy and for surgery. Um, and I think I'll stop there um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Margolis. No questions? Just a bunch of well-informed residents in this room. Very good. All right. Uh, well, you've got my email if any questions arise. Um, and uh, go save some lives. Thanks very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Margolis. Thank you. Thanks. Stay well. You too. Thanks.